Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll be commencing momentarily. We're just going to allow the room to fill up. We've got a, a healthy number of participants this evening, so we want to make sure everyone can get in okay. Um, as you know, this is, of course, a uh, joint educational webinar between the PKD Foundation of Canada and BC Renal. And so I would like to thank BC Renal for um, supporting us this evening and providing uh, some of the speakers as well. Uh, we have a wonderful presentation lined up for you uh, this evening from a variety of individuals that will um, discuss cannabis in patients with chronic kidney disease from a variety of angles. Um, we are planning for roughly a 90 minute presentation, but of course we'll see uh, how things a lot with the question and answer. We wanna make sure that if anyone has questions, uh, there is time to uh, answer all of those this evening. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Jeff Robertson and I'm the executive director for the PKD Foundation of Canada. Uh, and on behalf of uh, the PKD FOC, I'd again like to thank you for uh, taking the time to join us uh, today for this presentation. Uh, we're joined by uh, a number of people, as I mentioned, and I'm just going to start by running through their uh, bios briefly, and then we'll commence with the first portion of this evening's uh, presentation. Uh, we'll first be joined by Dr. Claudia Ho. Uh, she has been a clinical pharmacy specialist in nephrology at Fraser Health since 2015, providing direct patient care to peritoneal dialysis patients at Surrey Memorial and Royal Columbian Hospital. She completed her Bachelor of Science at the University of British Columbia and hospital residency in BC Lower Mainland Pharmacy Services. She then graduated with her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Toronto in 2019. Aside from developing dialysis-related medication policies, her current focus is leading a project to expand clinical pharmacy services in Fraser Health Kidney Care Centers. Academically, she lectures in undergraduate nephrology courses at UBC and is a co-investigator and study coordinator of the SAFE-D trial. She is also a member of the BC Renal Pharmacy and Formulary Committee and has contributed to drug reviews and the revision of several BC Renal guidelines. Uh, and this evening, Dr. Ho will be discussing the background and evidence on cannabis use. We'll then be joined by uh, Dr. Dan Martin Newson, uh, Provincial Director at BC Renal. Uh, he graduated from UBC, then completed a residency at Lions Gate Hospital in North Van and earned his uh, Farm D from the University of Washington. He became involved with the renal program at the Royal Jubilee Hospital in Victoria and has chaired the pharmacy and formulary committees with BC Renal since 2001. His main interests are improving outcomes for same or reduced costs at the patient and population level. And tonight, Dr. Martin Newson will be discussing uh, the practical considerations of cannabis use in chronic kidney disease patients. After Dr. Dan, we will have Dr. Mike Bevilacqua, uh, who you are all familiar with from a variety of uh, lectures that he's presented uh, with the foundation. Uh, Dr. Bevilacqua is a nephrologist based in Surrey, British Columbia. He is the chair of the Kidney Care Committee, uh, which oversees the care of over 15,000 British Columbians living with chronic kidney disease, and is also the medical lead for the BC Polycystic Kidney Disease Network, which aims to optimize management of PKD in BC. Uh, lastly, we'll be joined by uh, a patient partner this evening, uh, Paul Watson. Uh, Paul is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best-selling author of three books. And he of course has polycystic kidney disease and will be sharing his experiences this evening as well. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Ho uh, to take it from here. Um, so thank you. cannabis refers to any product that comes from the cannabis plant, and there are actually three main species. So there's sativa, indica, as well as ruderalis, and each of these species have their own characteristics. So cannabis sativa, for instance, is more energizing and more invigorating, whereas in indica is more calming and relaxing. And what's interesting is that you can actually uh, generate a very wide diversity of cannabis strains as well as a spectrum of effects. And how you can do that is actually by hybridizing streams. So we can actually blend, uh, we can blend sativa and indica, for instance, to create uh, different effects. Now, what's interesting about cannabis is that it contains over 500 chemicals and over 100 cannabinoids. 
And we actually haven't identified all these chemicals and their effects yet. Uh, but what a cannabinoid is, it's any chemical that can bind to specific receptors in the body and the brain to produce an effect that is similar to those uh, produced by the cannabis plant. Now, if we are referring to cannabinoids that are naturally produced in plants, uh, such as THC and CBD, we refer to these as phytocannabinoids. But what's interesting is that our body uh, naturally also produces chemicals that are similar uh, to uh, effects of cannabis, and these are called endocannabinoids. There are also synthetic cannabinoids, which are man-made. A good example of this would be Nabilone, which is a prescription medication that mimics THC. Next slide, please. So THC refers to tetrahydrocannabinol. And this uh, cannabinoid is actually the most studied cannabinoid uh, so far. And it is also the most abundant cannabinoid in cannabis. What you may know THC for is its uh, effects on producing intoxicating uh, effects and in, in producing a euphoria. Now, THC has its own bene beneficial effects, but it can also produce harmful effects at higher concentrations. Um, so for instance, some of these effects include hallucinations and feeling high, uh, drowsiness, uh, memory issues, as well as decreased physical coordination. And these type of side effects are known as psychoactive effects. Of course, THC also has its benefits. Uh, it can reduce pain, uh, increase appetite, as well as reduce nausea, but it can also cause blood pressure drops when patients are standing after sitting or lying position. Now, another type of cannabinoid is CBD. It's also known as, known as cannabidiol. Unlike THC, it does not have any psychoactive effects. It does not produce any high or intoxicating feelings. And in fact, it may actually counter or lower some of the effects of THC on the mind, uh, especially when you select uh, a strain, a cannabis strain that has similar amounts of CBD to THC or higher uh, amounts of CBD than THC. Now, the effects of CBD uh, certainly ha has a, uh, are more therapeutic in a sense. Uh, it can cause drowsiness, but it can also reduce pain. It can uh, relax muscles as well as prevent seizures. Uh, it also has anti-nauseant effects. Um, anti-inflammatory effects, and it reduces anxiety and calming. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the indica strains tends to be more calming and relaxing, and that's because it has higher CBD concentrations compared to um, THC. Now, because CBD also blocks, psychos uh, blocks the effects of THC, it can actually reduce uh, psychosis. And because both THC and CBD are actually the two most abundant cannabinoid in cannabis, uh, a lot of cannabis users, when they are selecting the effects that they want from cannabis, they tend to look at the percentages or ratios of THC to CBD. Next slide. Now, there's also a wide variety of administration routes of cannabis. Uh, one of the most popular methods of, of use is inhalation. So there's smoking, there's dabbing, and there's vaping. But I'd like to emphasize that inhalation is not a preferred route. And the reason being is uh, the side effects of this route often outweighs any benefit you would get, uh, especially if you're using for medical use. Now, smoking, for instance, uh, involves the burning of cannabis. And similar to cigarette smoking, this can generate a lot of toxic byproducts, including those that are cancer causing. And if you are smoking a blunt, for instance, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with blunts, um, a blunt is basically a hollowed out cigar wrapper that is packed with cannabis that is then smoked. The cigar wrapper itself contains tobacco, which um, some users may prefer because it gives an energy uh, or a buzz to the cannabis high. Um, but it also contains very high concentrations of cancer causing uh, nitrosamines, and that further adds to the risk. There's another method called dabbing. Um, dabbing involves inhale, inhaling the hot vapors from heated concentrates of cannabis. These co concentrates are called shatter or wax, and they can contain very, very high amounts of THC. And as you can imagine, it can uh, cause quite a bit of an intoxication. And dabbing has no role in medic uh, medical use. It's really uh, for recreational use. There is also vaping. Uh, vaping is when you heat the cannabis till it is converted to a gas and then inhaling it. Uh, vaping usually requires a vaping device or an e-cigarette um, device or an, a cartridge. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in, in August of 2019, there was a sharp surge in uh, hospitalizations uh, amongst young adults um, who were vaping. Uh, and they were diagnosed with something called e-cigarette use or vaping-associated lung injury. Uh, for short, it's called e -Valley. 
Um, so a lot of these uh, young adults were presenting with uh, respiratory failure as well as respiratory distress, um, some of them even requiring ICU admission and intubation. And what they found is in each of these cases, uh, the, uh, the patient was actually using THC containing e-cigarettes or vape pens um, that were mostly from street sources. And upon further investigation, it was thought that the vitamin E acetate, which is an additive that they add to the vaping products, may have been contributing to this. Now, when you ingest vitamin E uh, orally, it doesn't actually cause any harm. So if you're taking a vitamin E supplement, for instance, but when you inhale vitamin E, it can actually affect lung function. Uh, fortunately, these cases uh, peaked by September 2019, and since then, these cases have uh, gradually declined. Um, it's thought that since there was more awareness, uh, a lot of people were getting their vape pens from more official sources, and since then, vitamin E has also been removed um, as an additive. However, uh, the CDC actually still suggests to take caution when using this method of administration, simply because they cannot rule that there aren't other chemicals that could have uh, potentially caused uh, or contributed to uh, e value. Next slide, please. So other routes of administration of cannabis includes topical. Um, topical is when you apply cannabis oil or cannabis uh, ext extract in the form of a cream uh, onto the skin and it is absorbed uh, locally. Uh, this method is usually quite safe because there's minimal absorption of the medication into the bloodstream. However, there hasn't been a lot of research on this method and what, uh, in terms of like, what it can be used for. Another method is ingestion by drinking or eating. Uh, so examples of these would be cannabis teas, uh, baked goods, oil, gummies, or pills. Um, this is actually the preferred uh, route of administration if you are using it for medical use. Particularly, we would typically use oil or pills simply because it is uh, easier to dose. You know exactly how much you can uh, you need to take. Uh, whereas with teas and baked goods, it's harder to consistently take the same amount. Uh, with in ingestion, uh, it does bypass um, the side effects of the inhalation route. Um, however, it is a bit slower to kick in. Uh, it might take anywhere between one to two hours to, to kick in, whereas with inhalation, uh, the onset of effects is usually five to 10 minutes. Another method of uh, administration uh, uh, preferred for medical use is actually oral mucosal. This is essentially a um, mouth spray. So you can um, spray the uh, cannabis extract under the tongue or spray it into the mouth. Once again, it bypasses the harmful effects of inhaling um, or smoking cannabis. Um, and the extract is essentially absorbed through the linings of the cheek as well as the mouth. Um, and so this, net, this route can have a quick, quite a quick onset of action sometimes, um, as fast as 20 minutes. Next slide, please. So there are also what we call cannabinoid prescription medications. So they're cannabis-based medications. In Canada, there are only two products available in, on the market. Now, prescription cannabinoids are generally preferred over ca cannabis because they are highly regulated, meaning that the producers of these products have to follow good manufacturing practices. And um, routinely, they actually test the, the medications uh, for any contaminants, um, which, which would be safer for the patient. So the first prescription medication I'd like to talk about is Nabilone. Um, the brand name is called Sesamet. So Nabilone is the actual drug name and Sesamet is the brand name. It comes, of, uh, comes in the form of a capsule, and essentially what it is, is a man-made version of THC. It's been approved for use in uh, patients who have severe nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. However, it's also been used for other things such as AIDS-related loss of appetite or palliative or nerve pain. It takes around 60 to 90 minutes to work, so a bit slower in terms of uh, onset of action, um, but it does la last for eight to 12 hours. The drawback of this medication is that for 30 day supply, it can be a bit costly. Um, for an, a low dose, it would cost you anywhere between 40 to $50 for 30 days. But if you were using higher doses, it can easily set you back 500 to even $700 uh, for a month. Um, in British Columbia, we're quite fortunate. This medication is what we call uh, a, a formulary medication for, the, for, for Pharmacare, which is the government plan. Um, so if you've reached a deductible, uh, your family deductible, then this medication is actually covered by the government plan. Um, occasionally, private insurance will also cover this medication. And in terms of side effect, this medication, because it mimics uh, THC, the effects 
uh, the side effects are typically those of THC. So you may experience drowsiness, um, dizziness, uh, perhaps feeling intoxicated or feeling high. Um, some patients may also have a lack of concentration. Next slide. Now the second prescription medications I have uh, pre prescription medication I have here is uh, nabiximols. Um, the brand name is called Sativix, and it's it's uh, oral uh, or mouth spray. Um, it's it's basically a nat natural extract of THC and CBD, and this uh, this product has actually been used in a lot of research studies. Um, it's approved for use in patients with advanced cancer pain or multiple sclerosis. And the onset uh, can be quite variable. Um, it can be as fast as 20 minutes, but it can also be as long as 150 minutes. It's a bit shorter acting than the uh, nabilone. Um, and the major drawback of this is that for 30 days, it's even more expensive, unfortunately. Uh, for initial dose, it would cost $84. And if you're using um, much higher doses, it can be anywhere between $500 to $1,000. Now this product, unfortunately, is not, um, it's in a way it's not as accessible because there's actually no uh, coverage in British Columbia uh, for this product from the government. Um, and so we rarely see this being used. Uh, but if you look at the, the side effects, um, because there is the CBD component to it, which kind of mutes some of the THC effects, you will notice that the, um, the incidence of side effect is much lower. Uh, there are still chances of you experiencing dizziness or drowsiness um, and intoxication, but it's, it's less than usually 10%. Uh, next slide. So now that you kind of know some of the basics of cannabis, uh, we'll take a look at the evidence on cannabis use. So as you may know, patients with chronic kidney disease, uh, especially advanced stages, have a very high symptom burden. 81% uh, of them, for instance, experience fatigue, and 75% of them may report drowsiness, and 65% of them have pain. Now, um, the thing with these uh, symptoms is that even though we have some conventional medications uh, to use, a lot of these medications can also cause uh, side effects. Um, so with pain, for instance, uh, we tend to use a lot of opioids, uh, but opioids has a lot of drawbacks too. Um, opioids, for instance, can contribute to uh, falls as well as potential fatal overdoses. And a lot of uh, opioids, when they get broken down by the body, um, the metabolites can actually build up in kidney patients. And for this reason, since the legalization of cannabis, um, cannabis has been explored as an alternative therapy to treat a wide range of medical conditions. Um, but it's still very important to recognize which of these conditions are based on evidence and how cannabis actually compares to other already established treatments in terms of effectiveness as well as safety. Uh, next slide. So from um, this slide onwards, I'm going to use the term cannabinoids instead of cannabis. Uh, what I'm referring to here is not just cannabis-based products, but also um, prescription cannabinoids. So cannabinoids have been studied for a number of conditions and have actually been shown to be effective for a few things, including uh, chronic nerve pain, uh, chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting, um, symptoms of multiple sclerosis, such as abnormal muscle contractions, uh, as well as insomnia associated with obstructive sleep apnea, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, and multiple sclerosis. It has also been shown to be effective in um, improving extreme weight loss and muscle wasting in patients with HIV and AIDS. Now, I want to emphasize that the research to support um, the benefits studied in these conditions are based on short-term studies, and they are of low quality and uh, mostly done in small groups of non-chronic kidney disease patients. Ideally, what we would like to see is that these benefits have been consistently demonstrated over the long term and in large groups of patients uh, of chronic kidney disease patients perfectly, because that makes the results more accurate um, and more applicable to us. And so it's just important to recognize that the, you know, there are some drawbacks to the, the, the quality of the research that we have right now. So now let's take a closer look at some of these conditions that are more relevant to kidney patients. So chronic nerve pain is quite common in uh, uh, kidney disease simply because a lot of our patients have diabetes. And one of the complications of diabetes is something called neuropathy that can result in uh, nerve pain. So uh, based on current research that we have, uh, what, we, um, what we know is that when we compare cannabinoids uh, to no treatment or basically placebo, um, the cannab cannabinoids can actually reduce uh, chronic nerve pain by 30% when you give it over four weeks. 
Um, and how they uh, measured this or determined this is that they used a 10 point pain scale. So zero being no pain and 10 being uh, the most pain you've ever experienced. And they had patients rank their pain uh, before and after um, cannabinoid use. And they found that on average, uh, patients reported a three point reduction in pain. Now there's, uh, based on this research, um, they found that there is something called number, the number needed treat of 11. So what does this mean? Um, the number needed to treat of 11 means that you would have to give 11 patients uh, cannabinoids for four weeks in order for one patient to experience a 30% pain reduction. So then 11 is a bit of an odd number. So maybe we should, um, I'll give you an example and treat 100 patients instead. Sorry, can you click the next slide? So what if we treated 100 patients? Um, so this is actually what it would look like. Uh, each of these smiley faces would rep represent a patient and if we were to treat 100 of them, actually only nine of them would improve with treatment. And 66 of them would actually report no improvement. And 25 of them would actually report improvement even if we didn't give them treatment. So that's kind of a placebo effect. Next slide. So how do cannabinoids compare to other medications used for chronic nerve pain? So I'm, I'm gonna show you here um, this, this picture. Uh, and can you click the next? So um, the picture at the bottom here is the same picture that I showed you earlier for cannabinoids. And as mentioned, uh, the number needed treat is 11. And if you look at these other squares up here, um, these are other prescription medications that we typically uh, would use for treating chronic nerve pain. And if you look at the top left here, I have a medication called amitriptyline, which we use for nerve pain. And you can see that the number needed treat is four, meaning that if I treat four patients with amitriptyline, one patient would benefit um, in terms of pain reduction for, for, for nerve pain. And if we were to give it to 100 patients, as represented at, by these smiley faces again, 25 of them would actually have benefit. So if you were to compare that to cannabinoids, you can clearly see that amitriptyline is actually more effective than the cannabinoids. And of course, there's other medications here. So there's also high dose opioids. The number needed treat we can see is five, and with venlafaxine it is also five. And you, as you may probably have picked up, the lower the number needed to treat, the more effective um, the medication is. And so, um, essentially, compared to most of the prescription medications that we currently have, um, cannabinoids are actually not as effective. Can you click the next? Um, now, you're probably wondering, well, this is kind of an unfair comparison because we're only looking at effectiveness. So what about safety? You know, what if these prescription medications have more side effects? So I didn't include the side effects data right here on this slide, but I will show you, uh, show you some, some uh, statistics later. Um, what I can tell you for now is that um, the incidence of side effects with cannabinoids is actually quite high. And in most of these cases compared to these drug, these other prescription medications, um, it's likely that the, the risk for side effects is also higher. And because of this, um, a lot of the guidelines that we have available right now, which aren't actually that many, um, they actually do not recommend the use of cannabinoids as first or second choice for treating chronic nerve pain. Uh, in fact, they would uh, suggest using uh, cannabinoids for treating nerve pain only if a patient has failed three or more of the prescription medications. Next slide. So what about nausea and vomiting? Uh, this is another condition that we might see a bit more in dialysis or uh, patients in, with um, chronic kidney disease. Um, now, nausea and vomiting has been sp uh, studied in a very specific setting uh, when it comes to cannabinoids. Um, so cannabinoids have only been studied for, uh, for chemotherapy-associated nausea and vomiting, and it actually has been shown to be quite effective um, so if you can see the number need treat is three uh, and it actually has comparable effectiveness to other prescription medications that we typically would use in preventing chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting. Um, but similar to what we had mentioned earlier with chronic nerve pain, the risk of side effects are, um, are actually higher with cannabinoids than the typical prescription medications we currently have. And because of that, once again, they are not considered first or second choice and are only considered if there is an effective response to standard treatment. Now, cannabinoids have not been studied for chronic kidney disease uh, related or other types of nausea and vomiting, and they're not routinely used for these conditions. Uh, but in, in the setting, if a patient has tried a lot of different medications, um, some doctors may still um, try to uh, try a course of cannabinoids. Next slide. 
So another condition that our patients may experience is insomnia. Um, now, cannabinoids have been shown, that, shown to improve poor sleep associated with um, other conditions, uh, such as chronic pain and obstructive sleep apnea. But the benefits um, shown in the research studies have been very, very small. Um, and I'll give you some numbers here, just so you get an idea how it compares. So for poor sleep associated with chronic pain, uh, which is common in, in, in chronic kidney disease, the risk of side effects um, actually do outweigh the benefits. So based on the research findings, we found that one in 13 patients actually report improved sleep quality when it comes to cannabinoids, and one in five will report reduced sleep disturbance. But one in three patients will actually report dizziness. And so if a patient were to take cannabinoids, they, are, they have a higher chance of experiencing a side effect and not actually having benefit from the medication. Now, this is only one side effect. There are many other side effects of cannabinoids as well. So yeah, we have to keep that in mind. Next slide. So there are also conditions that cannabinoids have been shown to be ineffective for. So these include um, dementia, glaucoma, as well as depression in patients with chronic pain or multiple sclerosis. Next slide. Um, now, there are also some conditions where we, we're not sure, um, we don't actually have enough evidence right now to support cannab um, cannabinoids for its use. Uh, can you click? Perfect. Um, basically, um, for these conditions listed here, such as cancer, seizures, irritable bowel syndrome, um, studies have um, either not been done or uh, when the studies were done, it was of such low quality that we couldn't tell if there was any benefit or not. Now, just because there's a lack of um, studies show, uh, lack of studies or poor, or there's poor quality studies, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, cannabinoids are not effective for these conditions. It's just that at this point in time, we don't have enough uh, research findings to support it. Next slide. So what about side effects of cannabinoids? So unfortunately with cannabinoids, um, the side effects are often uh, very common and um, underappreciated as well. So a lot of people uh, feel that with cannabis, because it's natural, it's probably safe um, and it's not toxic. But the truth is that even things that are naturally made can be very toxic. Um, eight to nine out of 10 patients who use cannabinoids will actually develop a side effect. And one in 10 patients will stop treatment due to the side effect. So an example is drowsiness. Um, the, what I've mentioned here is something called number needed to harm. So kind of a similar concept, uh, if I were to give uh, five patients, uh, cannabinoids, one of them will actually experience drowsiness. Um, and other examples uh, would be speech disorder. Once again, I give it to five patients, one of them will dis uh, develop speech disorder. And if I give cannabis to six patients, one of them will probably develop muscle twitching. Next slide, perfect. Um, so let's talk about uh, some other side effects. So we can usually group um, most of the side effects of cannabis um, based on uh, organ systems. So uh, what, we're, what we have on the slide is um, side effects associated with the central nervous system or side effects on the brain. And so more common side effects of cannabinoids um, include drowsiness, dizziness, as well as feeling high. Um, as you can see, the incidence rates are quite high. So like with drowsiness, uh, up to 50% of patients can actually experience that. Uh, cannabinoids can also affect the mental health. Um, so uh, as you recall earlier, uh, THC can actually trigger psychotic episodes, and uh, it can also cause something called uh, a masking schizophrenia. So if a patient has a strong family history of schizophrenia and has higher risk for it, using cannabis can potentially uh, trigger a, a, psych a psychotic episode much earlier on in their life, uh, whereas if they didn't use it uh, perhaps later on in their life, they would then develop a, a psychotic episode. Now, in terms of functioning, cannabinoids can cause loss of memory and motivation. And there's actually some, some data that shows that if young, young adults or youth use cannabis, uh, they tend to underachieve in ed education. And of course, uh, some of you may know, uh, cannabis can cause impaired driving as well. Now, uh, one other thing that's interesting to talk about is the risk for addiction. Um, now, if you think about op prescription opioids, the risk for addiction is 5.5%. Now we don't have any data for um, medical uh, using cannabis for medical use uh, and what the risk of addiction is with that, but uh, with non-medical use uh, of uh, cannabis or cannabinoids, um, the, the risk of addiction is 9%, so it is actually higher. 
Um, it's hard to tell um, if we were to use it for medical use, the risk may be um, lower because we're using it in a more monitor setting and we may use more high, um, higher CBD content as opposed to THC and the THC content is actually associated with the addiction. Next slide, please. So other side effects um, include effects on the lungs and heart. heart and these side effects are uh, a bit more uh, dependent on the administration route. Um, and they're usually uh, associated with smoking uh, cannabis. And so if you're using other routes, these side effects are not as applicable. So with smoking cannabis, uh, patients may develop fungal infections and um, something called um, uh, COPD or chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. Um, patients may also uh, possibly uh, have increased chance of developing lung cancer. In terms of uh, the heart, uh, can cannabinoids can increase heart rate. Uh, it can also cause blood pressure drops, as I mentioned earlier, especially when you change your uh, posture. And there's also some concern that it may increase the risk of heart attack, uh, especially an hour after smoking. Other side effects of cannabinoids also include gastrointestinal. Um, so because of the CBD content, um, ironically, uh, cannabis use can sometimes cause a decrease in appetite, especially if you have higher CBD. Uh, um, concentrations compared to THC or similar amounts. Uh, it can also cause vomiting as well. Um, and there's actually something called severe cyclic vomiting. Um, and this tends to be associated with patients who are using high doses of cannabis chronically. Next slide, please. So uh, there's something also called cannabis use disorder. What this essentially is, is, is cannabis addiction. Now, as, as mentioned, 9% of adults who use um, non-medical can cannabis will develop an addiction. Um, the risk for addiction is not the same for everybody. Uh, the risk of the, uh, addiction depends on a number of things. Uh, first of all, it depends on how long you have been using cannabis and how much cannabis you use, and also the um, concentration of THC. So the higher the THC concentration, um, the more addictive it is. It also depends on the individual patient's uh, factors. So um, sometimes uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at patients, um, some of them may have um, a genetic risk for drug addiction or, um, uh, drug, uh, or history of drug abuse. For those patients, we would strongly not, uh, we would advise not to use ca uh, ca cannabis or cannabinoid products. Um, and also for patients who are relatively young, it's best that they avoid it uh, because the risk of addiction does increase with younger age. If you are using cannabis therapy and you are worried about this, um, there is a, a way to monitor. So um, here we've listed um, some symptoms, uh, signs and symptoms. So for instance, if you notice that you start developing increase in tolerance in terms of the dose, or you have tried several times to quit and you've been unsuccessful and you've had at least two or more of, of these symptoms over a 12 month period, it's very important you talk to your doctor uh, because there may be uh, a chance that you may be developing cannabis use disorder here. Next slide. So who shouldn't use cannabinoids? Um, there, there are a few, few, few groups of um, patients who shouldn't. Um, so patients who are less than 25 years of age uh, the concern here is that uh, cannabinoids may affect the uh, brain development. And until we reach an age of 25, our brain, uh, brains are actually not fully developed yet. And of course, we don't want to use cannabinoids in patients with a family history of psychosis because uh, THC can trigger the, uh, the attacks or make this condition worse. Uh, and if the patient has a history of drug addiction or abuse, uh, we should also av avoid cannabinoid use simply because the risk for addiction is, is too high. With um, smoked cannabis, uh, we would avoid it in patients with severe heart disease, stroke, as well as lung disease because of the side effects that we mentioned in a previous slide. And another population that should avoid cannabinoids are uh, pregnant, uh, pregnant females who are uh, contemplating pregnancy or breastfeeding uh, simply because cannabinoids can increase the chance of having a stillbirth as well as um, admission into the, into the hospital. So now we'll be, uh, I'll be passing the mic to my colleague here. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ho. I'm going to attempt to give Dr. Martin Newsom control. Dan, if you'd like to try, we'll throw it over to you for practical considerations. <laughs> 
Thank you, and uh, thanks, Claudia, for going, uh, doing the heavy lifting and going through the evidence. And, you know, I just uh, want to say that um, uh, Claudia did an excellent job at presenting the evidence such as it is. Uh, you know, we, uh, an, an absence of evidence is not absence, uh, an evidence of absence of effect. So those studies need to be done to help us fully describe and define the benefits and harms. But, um, uh, you know, at, at the current state, we can only reflect and tell you about the evidence at hand. So um, with that in mind, I'll go through some practical considerations. Uh, let's see if it is allowing me to advance. No such luck, Dan. You're muted. You muted yourself in the process. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. So, um, uh, if you can, uh, I've given you back control. There we go. So, you know, how do you, uh, if you're interested in trying cannabis, um, you've had uh, either you've used it in the past or you've had friends or relatives that uh, recommend it, or you just are not. Um, achieving the sort of uh, symptom reduction that you'd like. So you're interested. So uh, how do you go about getting it? <clears throat> There's really three ways. At the top, the prescription uh, cannabis that, or cannabinoids that uh, uh, Claudia went over. Um, these are regulated. It's a very known quantity. We know precisely the side effects. Um, that's quite well studied. Um, but it is expensive. <clears throat> and uh, if you have private insurance or if you're able to access the Pharmacare um, formulary coverage for Navalone, that might be a way to try it. Um, the next level of uh, um, sort of a guarantee is with medical authorization. So you have a physician who uh, writes a prescription for it <clears throat> and uh, uh, you know, gets registered, um, you can get registered for uh, using this for your own medical purpose. And uh, getting registered has the benefit that you can actually have a greater quantity on hand than uh, um, the law would allow for uh, uh, recreational use or unregulated use. And uh, the cannabis that is supplied is uh, through a Health Canada licensed producer. And it's done through a, a mail and courier system. Often they'll have a website uh, and you can get in touch, uh, have a conversation online or over the phone with uh, a consultant um, uh, who is employed by the medical producer to tailor the product to your individual um, needs and work with you to uh, titrate dose and frequency. Occasionally this cannabis uh, is covered by private insurance. Uh, so that's something for you to dig into with your private insurer uh, if you have such coverage. And uh, Veterans Affairs will cover this as well. So if you're a, a veteran and uh, cannabis has been also studied more recently in um, PTSD. And so that's an avenue that uh, can be explored. And beyond that, uh, cannabis retail store. Uh, so this retail store um, may be licensed um, by a province. And so it's regulated product. Again, um, there's um, benefits to having a regulated product. Um, however, uh, if you're going through um, uh, an unregulated store that isn't licensed, whether it's online or has a storefront, um, it's up to you, um, maybe at the guidance of um, the person behind the counter, how, however they are experienced to guide you, but uh, it's really up to you to figure out the product, uh, the dosing, the route, uh, and monitor it yourself, uh, and there's really minimal guidance. And uh, if it is not, if sort of the, what we call the black market, uh, it's not regulated by Health Canada or the province, then, um, you know, there can be impurities and you may not be guaranteed the, um, uh, the concentration or the, the uh, same experience from one batch to another. Um, medical and application forms for medical cannabis can be found on the Health Canada website. And uh, not all prescribers um, uh, 
participate in this, but if um, if you're interested, they can guide you to somebody who is. Next slide, please. So the unlicensed or illicit cannabis uh, in Canada still commands a fair size of the market. Um, they, they do tend to command lower prices. So the regulated uh, legal cannabis can be up to 80% more expensive. Um, there's wider product selection and uh, uh, some pretty imaginative forms, uh, cannabis drinks. So instead of a, uh, a beer or an alcoholic beverage, uh, you know, you might have a, have a beverage that way or gummies or chocolate. Um, now, again, the, distract, the detractants from that is it can contain contaminants because um, it is unregulated. There might be heavy metals or pesticides, molds. They might uh, uh, use cutting agents. And the, the amount of THC or CBD and the ratios might be false, might be misleading, or they're just unknown. Um, so uh, um, they can contain harmful levels of THC, so you do get those side effects. So it's it's problematic, and of course, with any online, um, uh, particularly any illicit product, uh, there's a risk for identity theft or financial fraud, so you have to be on the wear for that. Now, legal cannabis, uh, it's... It, um, uh, almost completely the opposite, where it is a quality control. It's tested for harmful levels of contaminants. Uh, we know the the purity and the uh, the THC and CBD levels, and that will be uh, similar from batch to batch. Uh, so you can trust the labeling. And if there's if there's any recalls, then um, they would uh, be able to get in touch, and you know that you would know uh, that it's been recalled. Uh, However, the licensed storefronts uh, may not be as widely available. The online stores are an alternative in that case. Uh, it's more costly, but again, you can um, consider registering yourself with Health Canada and even you can grow it for your own self-use uh, to reduce costs. Next slide, please. So the key message here is really the one that's in bold and underlined, uh, start low and go slow. So you need to know how it affects you you need to do that in a safe environment. So say if, you, if you're working, um, maybe on the weekend at bedtime, uh, you know, uh, or at 7 p.m., that allows time for assessment. So typically, if it's an edible, um, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, you may begin to feel that effect, uh, and yet that may be delayed. So um, it may take up to four hours to feel the peak effect. Um, and then it tapers off after that. So if you're using it for symptoms to help you get to sleep or have a restful night, um, once you get to know it, you may choose uh, an hour before bedtime uh, to, to take that. Uh, but otherwise, as a get to know you sort of phase, uh, uh, you know, to start low and go slow, 7 p.m. And uh, with CBD oil, you can start with two to three milligrams. Uh, same with a, with a gummy. Um, it may you may have to cut uh, to get that low a dose. You may have to get a knife and cut that gummy, but uh, uh, starting low and going slow. And uh, um, again, you know, the, the notion of um, uh, repeat dosing or frequent dosing, uh, you have to be careful because it does take some time to, to have an effect on you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> dried cannabis, this is uh, particularly problematic if you want to titrate the dose. So one puff of a joint uh, can any be anywhere from one to 10 milligrams of uh, THC. Uh, and this, you know, <clears throat> can vary. That's the concentration. But how deeply you inhale um, and uh, how you inhale, you can actually, uh, ex, you know, in the process of inhaling and exhaling, you can have 50% of the dose go out into the local environment. Um, so, you know, others may be breathing that in. And so if you're new to cannabis, um, or if you, you had it as a, a long time ago, if you uh, try to get back into it, try to start with a product that's uh, under 10% THC and with uh, some amount uh, or a greater amount that is CBD, uh, because really as, as uh, Claudia uh, alluded to, 
we want a ratio uh, and probably a higher CBD content to THC. Um, so start with one inhalation and it should have a pretty fast onset because uh, the lung to brain um, is pretty quick, a lot quicker than the oral route. So uh, wait 15 minutes to feel how, how that hits you. Um, and then you can um, have another inhalation and you can increase, uh, you know, until you get a desired symptom control. Um, but be careful with the uh, inhalation. Uh, next slide, please. Now, drug interactions, uh, as, as uh, Claudia mentioned, uh, it can be sedating. Um, it can affect your appetite. Uh, and you may be on other medications that do exactly that as well. So medications uh, can cause drowsiness, uh, can cause lower blood pressure. And so this could be additive. So uh, it really, it's about getting to know this when you start down this path and knowing what medications you are already on that could cause these side effects. So it could increase that drowsiness that you may experience or confusion, or even if, you, if something makes you a little unstable, unbalanced, um, that you might fall, uh, this you know, may add to that. So do it, trying this at, at home in a controlled environment, uh, when you're not going to drive, when you're not going to do something that requires mental alertness uh, is, is the way to uh, um, get into the get to know you phase with this. So next slide, please. So um, really to remove the stigma of um, cannabis, uh, I think, you know, just be open and honest that you consult a pharmacist, say, hey, you know, I've got um, kidney, uh, reduced kidney function, I've got kidney disease, um, I'm on these other medications, I'd like to try this to see if it, it benefits me. Uh, are there any drug interactions or what should I watch out for? So it could be just uh, spacing, you know, the doses uh, of other things to this. Um, and uh, it just, uh, you know, again, go slow and start low. Next slide. So if you're on cannabis or have been using cannabis, uh, if you uh, stop abruptly, you can get some withdrawal effects. And uh, to avoid this, uh, really it's a matter of tapering uh, this drug over time. And uh, you know, we do this with antidepressants and uh, other prescription medications that we, we gradually uh, taper it. If you're on small doses and use it infrequently, perhaps you can just stop it. But um, uh, within one to two days of regular use, you might feel uh, or others may notice uh, that you have anger or aggression. You may notice an appetite change, um, some sleeping difficulties. And so uh, um, just be on the lookout for that. And if you uh, notice that or others notice that in you, maybe uh, just taper it off a bit more slowly. Next slide, please. So key points, uh, prescription cannabinoids rather than cannabis itself. Um, these have been on the market for some time now. They're a known quantity. Uh, they can be prescribed by any prescriber without any additional regulation or authorization. Um, inhaled cannabis is not a preferred route. Uh, and uh, for all the reasons uh, uh, Dr. Ho presented, and uh, it, it's... Um, does have those added concerns of uh, worsening heart disease and having a rapid onset. And uh, uh, it'd be a shame to suffer a fall because um, uh, you've, you, the balance got really uh, unsteady for you. Next slide. So uh, the benefit uh, of these products uh, is really probably when we have a ratio or some THC uh, and uh, CBD, but really we want to have a higher CBD to THC ratio to get the benefit, um, the health benefit, um, and there's uh, less severe health risk with that. And uh, can't emphasize enough um, that you should uh, not drive or plan to uh, need, need uh, uh, concentration for any activity. Um, and know that alcohol, uh, because that is a depressant and it, um, can also um, uh, uh, give you those um, uh, 
uh, high or the uh, the altered senses <clears throat> that you have to be very careful with that. And if you're also taking sedatives, whether it's a benzodiazepine such as Ativan or uh, other sedatives, this is um, uh, you have to be very careful if you go down that road. Next slide, please. So uh, we'll be happy, uh, we'll hang around after for a, a conversation with you and, and having any uh, um, specific questions answered, but now I'll turn it over to Dr. Mike Belabequa. Great, thanks Dan and, and Claudia for, for a really great overview. So um, so for my section now, you know, taking all of that into account, because I think that was a really, really great overview of what the state of the evidence is, some practical considerations, now I want to talk a little bit about practically how I see this kind of integrating into to care of patients with kidney disease and including the care of patients with polycystic disease. So, oops, sorry, I clicked twice. Oh, so yeah, I got the I got the thing to work the the control there. Works one out of three. There we go. Um, so you know, to go over a general approach is kind of what I'm going to talk about today. Now I want to start with the same disclaimer that Claudia did at the beginning. That in all situations, uh, I think this is really something to discuss with your care team who knows your own needs and your situation and, and all your other treatments, because it's really has to take that whole context in, right? I'm going to give some general thoughts here, but please do take this all back and, and discuss it with your individual team. And really what I want to go into a little bit more detail about is how we might see the role of medical cannabis fitting in amongst other treatments. And then again, some steps to take if you've decided to, to do it, kind of building on what uh, Dan just went through. So, the first step when we're thinking about this is discussing it with your team. And, and I really want to echo, I think it was uh, Dan and Claudia both said this, that, you know, honesty is important and, and honesty on a few fronts when we, when you want to bring this up with your care team, really to present, you know, why it is you were thinking about trying this and specifically what it is that you think you might be able to get benefit from. In other words, you know, just going in and saying, I've decided to try, you know, cannabis might not be as useful as saying, you know, I'm having this, these handful of symptoms, and you know, I've tried some other things, and, and I want to see you know what benefit I might get. So just an upfront conversation about what your expectations are uh, from this, and then the other things that I think are even more important to really be uh, forthcoming about is is kind of some personal background, and some of these might be per personal questions, but I think they're important. Knowing if this is something that you've had any experience, and either recreationally or medically, you know that does kind of feed into to what I might expect as the care provider. So it's important to be upfront about that. And the thing that I think is the most important uh, to be upfront about is if there is any history either in yourself or even in family members of really significant mental health issues or substance use issues. As you heard from Claudia, actually one of the strongest thing, uh, uh, risk considerations that we think about when people are trying cannabis is around um, schizophrenia, for example, if there is anyone in the family who had ever had this, so this doesn't even mean a personal history, I, I do have hesitancy about using this, and there are some pretty clear guidelines that we need to be pretty careful about that. If there's any history of substance uh, misuse, again, this isn't to be judgmental, it's just something that we really need to factor into our decision making before we can decide if this is going to be uh, right for you. So being honest about these types of, of information is going to be very, very important in this conversation. And, you know, the, the part I want to add about, about in terms of that honesty is I, I really do think uh, that, you know, stigma around use of cannabis has dramatically decreased. You know, I can say so, at least speaking in the BC environment, uh, and I think especially since this was legalized even for recreational use a, a few years ago. Um, it's not zero, though. I want to be honest about that part, right? You know, depending on, on which interactions you have and which care providers, you might still have someone who might look at you sideways if you, if you decide to bring this up. So it's always possible. I'm not going to say it's zero, but it definitely is a lot less than it used to be. So I do think this is something you can have a frank conversation with without worry of what your care provider is going to think about you. Um, I use the example, and it actually comes up as a frequent question. Uh, you know, for example, here in British Columbia, I know that our even our transplant teams don't really, you know, mind whatsoever either about medical or even recreational cannabis use, right? Just like they might say to somebody who has a few drinks on the weekend, you know, that wouldn't necessarily disqualify them. It would be the same thing here, and so that just shows the progress of of, of how things have come. Again, I can't guarantee every care provider across the country is going to feel the same way, but it's definitely come a long way. And so I think we're at a place where you can be open and honest with your care team about this. 
Okay, but so let's let's say you've started having this conversation with this team and you want to think about, is this going to be right for me? So I've kind of built in, in my mind what I would see as being the little process that you go through to, to think about this, building on what we heard about all the evidence. So the first is to figure out, okay, what problem are we trying to solve? What symptom is it that we're addressing? And that, that's that's why that's always the starting point. And so when I look at that as a medical professional, I think, you know, because we heard that there are some, some potential downsides here. So the first question is, is there a different treatment that might be better off, that might be safer, that might be more effective? And if that's the case, of course, I'm going to try to direct you to that. As you heard Claudia say, there for a lot of symptoms we might address, there are other first line treatments. And so we want to make sure we've explored all those options. You might be in a situation though where you come to thinking of cannabis for one of two reasons. Either there isn't really something that addresses your specific symptom, or what's more common is that maybe you've tried other different treatments and haven't really found that much effect. So now we're coming back to thinking, okay, is there a role for cannabis? And this is where then I go back and think, okay, what's the state of the evidence here? And, and I kind of put it into three groups. Um, I like to think of things in color coding, you know, stoplight type fashion. So one group is that there's clear situations where we shouldn't really think about this, where there's no evidence. And in fact, that there might be quite substantial harm uh, associated with it. That's where I give up the, uh, or give the example of people who have or, uh, quite, you know, uh, uncontrolled or quite severe psychiatric conditions. I'm talking again, if we're talking about things like schizophrenia and things like this, or if we're talking about it for, for uh, very poorly controlled symptoms, I think there's a different care route to go there. Another example that might be more relevant to, to our, our, our PKL, PKD realm is for acute pain episodes, right? So if someone's having a kidney stone or something like this for acute, severe, sudden onset pain, or the example that the people have looked at in, in, in the more mainstream literature is someone's broken an arm or, you know, a, a mechanical injury, this, there's not a role here. We have other treatments that we look at for, for that situation. So there's some clear situations where we don't go down that road. There are some other situations where there might actually be some good evidence of benefit. Claudia went through the list. Unfortunately, in kidney diseases, there aren't a lot of things on that list, but there are some situations where it's very clear evidence. And so where most things fall, and actually where pretty much everything falls when we're talking about, you know, in, in the kidney realm, is in this middle group where we don't really have a clear, what we call contraindication, meaning a clear red flag that we can't use it. It's not a clear green light, but we still want, want to consider it. So how do we approach that? Because as I say, this is going to be most symptoms that we have here. And I'll use the example here of, of, of chronic pain and polycystic disease. In the, in the PKD population, I think this is the most common situation where this might come up. So yes, we have some other alternatives that can be quite safe and effective. Um, through the PKD Foundation, we've developed some resources that actually go through a lot of chronic pain management strategies right, actually non-pharmacologic therapy, so meaning no medicines, but focusing on pain management strategies, some mindfulness techniques, various kind of uh, physiotherapy and movement related techniques. This is actually the first thing that we should always try in these situations. So we always try that, and I direct my patients to try this first. There are some situations we might even do medical interventions, depending on cyst size and things like that, right? So we explore those options. But then if not, we come back to this uh, realm where we say, okay, what's the role here? And what we heard is we don't have clear evidence, but I want to go to what we mean by we don't have clear evidence one way or another. Claudia talked us through this presentation of numbers needed to treat and the various uh, treatments. This is talking about neuropathic pain. I just stole the figure there, but I think we could find similar uh, figures for a lot of different symptoms. And the way I look at it is uh, yes, we do have some treatments that we would call first line before we use cannabinoids, right? So like Claudia said, we have you know, amitriptyline and opiates and things like this. But I almost look at this sometimes as the flip side, meaning in all of these figures, there are still a lot of red faces there. So there are a lot of people, regardless of which treatments that they've tried, are not going to see improvement in their symptoms. So I look at this as saying there's a large unmet need when we're trying to manage some of these symptoms. And that's why I, I like to work through that little algorithm I just showed you of saying, sure, try other things if there's evidence that there's safe, effective treatments. But we know that a lot of people are going to come out on the other side of that and still have the same degree of symptoms and didn't really find a lot of benefit from it. 
And so this is where now we start to think about, okay, I think this is reasonable to try something else. If you've exhausted the options that we know are, are safe and proven and it's not helping, then I think coming to, to, to consider, is this going to be a benefit for me, is, is a very reasonable thing. So this is the conversation that I really like to have with my patients of saying there are definite pros and cons. As we heard going through this, there are definite side effects to, to using cannabis. And I, I like to emphasize that because sometimes people come to it as, I think Claudia was the one who mentioned saying, well, this is natural and I've heard all kinds of people doing it. So there's no downside. As, as a physician, I'll tell you, everything has a pro and con. If somebody's telling you they've got a treatment that's all benefit with no side effects, they're selling you something because that's, that's never the case for anything. There's always going to be a pro and con. And so we need to discuss that very clearly and go into this with realistic expectations of both. You know, so when we're talking about, for example, chronic pain and polycystic disease, if I have a patient who's concerned in cannabis, I'd say, you know, there's not clear evidence that this is definitely going to help you've tried all these other options and you haven't really seen much of a benefit. So I think it's as reasonable if you want to try this, but you need to know these side effects to look out for, and you need to know these downsides that we just heard all about. And that's the way I think to really consider this is going in with eyes wide open and realistic expectations. And after that conversation, if people decide that they want to go down this road and, and try uh, a cannabis, then I think the next step is really doing it in a prudent and safe fashion. And, you know, Dan uh, took us through, I think, some great considerations in terms of practical uh, practicalities around dosing and obtaining uh, the cannabis. I, I love this document. If you Google this, it comes up. It can, it's uh, from a Canadian Institute. I forget what the abbreviation stands for now. But I really love the way it focuses on saying, okay, if we've decided to do this, let's make sure we're doing it in the safest way possible. It talks about ways to consider roots, you know, edible versus inhaled versus the, the tinctures. It talks about ways to kind of start low and go slow, the best, you know, kind of practical ways to, to, to obtain this. And I think this is really the right approach if someone's decided to try a cannabis for a medical symptom is to say, okay, to try to, let's try to minimize the downsides of it as much as possible and then see if we can get the, the benefit from it. So I, I would love to point people to this resource. I think it's a really, really great one. The part that I want to emphasize, you know, just like Dan did, um, uh, about the importance of doing this in a safe way. You know, Dan went through the, the the pros of getting this in a regulated fashion, and you know, so I won't belabor that much more here. But I, I really want to say that we have a good example that played out in real time of this, and and this was that E Valley that that Claudia mentioned, you know, that happened a few years ago, right? I think it really drove home that when we have something that's easily accessible from all fronts, frankly. I'm not sure other parts of the country, but for years here in, in British Columbia, it's been very, very easy to find a, you know, a, an illegal or unregulated dispensary on any street corner for, for many, many years, and you can walk in and get whatever you wanted. Um, but it shows a role of having proper regulation, right? We had that outbreak that frankly came from what is essentially a contaminant. Uh, in an unregulated product, right? And so it kind of shows the value of making sure that we're getting this from a regulated and reliable source. And the other thing that I think really, you know, drives home aside from, uh, to, you know, here's a picture of the typical type of place you might've seen in BC on the right hand side, you know, be, before things were legalized compared to now. Um, you know, in addition to getting to, uh, regulated products, uh, some places out there actually, they'll have very useful people here that are uh, um, uh, behind the counter. Now, they're not medical experts. You need to talk to your medical team about this. But in terms of helping to guide you through, um, you're in a lot better shape going in a regulated place than kind of this, this place on the right-hand side. Yeah, you might save a few dollars on, the, on that other side, but, uh, you know, I, I think the risks are, are far outweighed by the, the benefits of going to a regulated place. So, you know, that was kind of a whirlwind of, of the tour of trying to think about it, now starting the process. And the last part I want to really emphasize, if you've decided to do this, is, so one, I said start low and go slow. Dan already went over that. But the next thing I want to really emphasize is the follow-up. I think this is just as important as selecting the right agent and using it appropriately, is then reassessing afterwards. One of the things we know about a lot of these chronic symptoms, so or sorry, these long-term symptoms, chronic pain, but a lot of other them, a lot of others, is they tend to kind of go up and down. They wax and wane as time goes on. Some might resolve on their own. When you saw those happy face pictures, that yellow group, the placebo group, getting better, well, that tells you actually sometimes things just get better on their own if we do nothing. 
And the same might happen with some of the side effects. They might wax and wane, they might come and go, and it can be a little bit hard if you've been, say, trying this for a couple months to now figure out what worked and what didn't. So this is where I think following it along as you do it is very important. And I really, really um, emphasize the value of something like a symptom journal, right? In real time, trying to kind of keep track of, okay, this is what my pain was like. I keep using the example of chronic pain because uh, it's the most common here. But so this is what my pain was like before I started trying cannabis. And, you know, you journal that for a little while. Uh, again, for a little while, not just one day, because it will go up and down. Then you do the same thing afterwards and you would record, you know, whatever other side effects you might have too. And, and doing that in real time is really the way to do it. Because if you're trying to reflect for what happened over the last month, it's pretty hard to add that up. Whereas when you do this, you can kind of see it play out and see the patterns that, that come out. And then you can go over this again with your, with your healthcare team and really see, okay, was this something I'll benefit from and should I continue? Or if it didn't really seem to make much of a difference, uh, you know, then maybe uh, it, it's not the route to go for you. Claudia had already talked about some of the, the signs to be aware of, of, of dependence. And I, I think that's a frank conversation to have too. Again, people, I think often uh, you view cannabis as something that is is not, you know, uh, addictive in the sense that other substances are, are, and frankly, that's true. It's not to the degree of some other substances we might have, but that doesn't mean it's zero. Again, I think we do it a disservice if people say this is a completely non-addictive, a completely non-dependence uh, forming substance, because that's 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 not the case. And I think being, uh, you know, uh, honest and going into clear expectations about that is important as well. So that's kind of my, my whirlwind tour of how I practically, uh, you know, walk someone through and hopefully that general approach resonates with people. Again, please take it back to your care team if it's something you're deciding to, to think about. But then with that, I think the best way to finish this, all of this off is you heard about the evidence, we heard about some considerations, we heard about my approach, but I'd love to turn it over to Paul now who's going to share his personal experience uh, uh, with this topic. Uh, fair warning, I'm going to sound like a bad patient after, after some of that, but um, so be it. You get gold stars all the time, Paul. Don't worry, okay? You're... Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm requesting control. Is that the right step? That is, and it okay. just popped in, so I'll accept it now, and you should have access. Okay, thanks. Just a, a, a quick disclaimer. I'm obviously only one person, one patient, um, and I'm going to describe... Uh, you know, who I am in a second. So it, it, it's important to remember that my experience will not be your experience. And the best way to navigate through this is with a healthcare professional. Um, but again, the caution that, and, and I think uh, patients uh, have experienced this, uh, pain is one of the things that medical professionals have some difficulty dealing with. Uh, because we talk about pain uh, as a, a broad category, but there are specific kinds of pain. And I think I'm becoming an expert in the language of pain because I regard it as kind of an alarm system. And, uh, you know, just as you wouldn't climb up on a ladder and pull the batteries out of your CO2 alarm, when it goes off, um, you don't want to ignore what your body's alarm system is saying, uh, you wanna to try to understand what those specific pains are all about. Um, so the, the highs and lows of, of cannabis relief, the, this is a unique discussion uh, purely as a lay person because we're, we're talking about uh, something that is a medicine that will relieve pain, but it's also a recreational drug. It's something that's fun. Um, the euphoria, quite frankly, uh, is enjoyable. If, if you use it responsibly, um, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. But it's also a seductive drug, and so you have to be extremely careful. You may start out addressing pain and become seduced by something that transforms your personality, your ability to work, your ability to function in society. So you really need to watch yourself. And the idea um, that Mike just discussed, I think it was, or others, of a symptom diary uh, is very helpful so that you can, in lucid moments, check yourself to make sure you're not going too far or getting off track. The 
the, the other unique part about this, and others have touched on it, is that the research is evolving. So we as patients are effectively experimenters. You can Google, you can talk to your medical professionals, you can read the labels, but in the end, it's, it's you that's going to decide. Is this working for you? How is it affecting you? How is it affecting those around you? So th the only way I have been able to come to the point where I am, and I think I've reached a, a manageable balance, is through experimentation. And experimentation um, can be a dangerous thing. So again, you have to be extremely careful. Uh, a brief background, I, I started using cannabis uh, uh, almost half a century ago when I was a teenager in high school. And uh, anyone who's listening who is in that same group, beware, because, uh, you know, we called it marijuana in those days or pot. Uh, it wasn't very strong. It's very strong today, depending on what strain you choose. So you've really got to follow that advice if you're just beginning or just coming back into it of start low, go slow. Um, since we're dealing with pain, that's going to be a problem for you because if you start too low, you're not going to get pain relief. And, and let's be honest about this, that this can be expensive. Um, I, I spend roughly of $45 a month, and I think that's on the low end. So experimentation, if it takes too long, it is not going to benefit you. It's going to cost too much money. So seek advice from, from others who have followed this same route, as well as your medical professionals, so that you can get to relief quicker if, if that's the route you choose. I'm 63 years old. So the, the, there are some complications that come with aging and cannabis use. Um, I have an e uh, estimated GFR of 24. It has dropped lower than that, but those uh, listening with uh, PKD know that it bounces around. The, uh, I had leveled off for a few years, but it started to take a more steep drop. So I think I have maybe, uh, you know, my nephrologist advises maybe two years maybe less uh, before end stage. So that also affects my choices about pain. Um, the, both age and my kidney function. Um, let's be honest about this. Uh, I have a serious illness among other serious illnesses. And if I can put a smile on my face by using some cannabis, then you might as well. You're not going to live forever. Um, if you're doing it responsibly, then uh, no big deal. Um, some co comorbidities that I think are important to note because these came up earlier. I have heart disease. I landed in hospital uh, just over two weeks ago with chest pain. Uh, I don't know if it's related to cannabis use, but it certainly could be. But the, the heart disease pre, uh, predates uh, my more intense use. Um, I have uh, hypertension, which is not very well controlled by drugs. Uh, I have a dissected aneurysm on my right carotid arter artery. Uh, that can burst uh, at any moment. So, um, you know, as I use uh, cannabis and try to deal with all the other stuff, uh, I try to be fatalistic about it. Um, if uh, you know, I happen to be enjoying myself on a Saturday night and it all goes poof, then so be it. I also have fibromuscular dysplasia, an inherited disease which affects the inner walls of your arteries. Uh, so the, I'm, I have to be uh, con uh, conscious of that at all times. My kidneys are the size of footballs. Uh, I'll show you those in a second. And that's where we get to the unique nature, I think, of polycystic kidney disease and pain. Um, you know, you, the other patients who are uh, with us tonight, I think, can back me up on this. Um, you can talk to medical professionals who are not specifically experts in PKD and talk about the pain, and they just won't understand it. 
because they don't understand how big your kidneys are. Um, the exercise is key to relieving the pain, I think, as part of a broader strategy, but that's a vicious circle because at times I'm in so much pain, I can't sit up, I have to lie down. So my goal, uh, because I, I realize I'm never gonna eradicate the pain, I can only manage it. So my, my goal is to get the pain down to a level where I can function, I can get out, do some walking, do some sailing, and take my mind off all the rest. Uh, I'm clicking here and it doesn't come. That, that, sorry, can I go back? Yeah, just uh, hit oh, your left arrow. There you go. Here we go. Uh, so, so those are my kidneys. Uh, that's more than a year old, so they're bigger because they're growing by about four or five percent a year. As you can see, they're pressing against everything that's down there, organs, muscles, spine. Uh, and um, forgive me if I'm uh, too graphic, but I have episodes of blood in my urine. Now, now here we get to the to, to my sort of obsession with obs understanding different kinds of pain. I have burning pain. I have dull sort of chronic pain. I have extremely sharp pains from time to time that feel like they're running down the bones, uh, uh, you know, my ribs, my spine. So I have different ways of dealing with different levels of pain. The, uh, I, I have had uh, chronic pain as my kidneys have expanded over time, um, but it was, uh, I could live with it. It, it. it wasn't constant. It wasn't happening frequently enough that it was a serious problem until 2021. And I don't know what it was. I rolled badly in bed or something, but it just exploded and it was excruciating and it was constant. And it was all those types of pain that I just mentioned and more. Um, so I, I couldn't function. The, the, the to, um, Canada legalized uh, cannabis use in 2015. I had gone um, before legalization to what was then known as a pot doctor uh, colloquially, obviously, the uh, and and frankly, my experience wasn't that good. The uh, in those days, you had to get a form signed by um, a physician for the Health Canada clearance to have medical cannabis. And the the doctor that I went to, who I found online, because there weren't a lot of doctors in those days, who were because of the legal status of it. Um, who, there weren't a lot of doctors you could easily go to to have this conversation. So I found one outside of Vancouver, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just describing my experience. Um, I had the impression that the doctor was high, that I've, I've been around high people before. Uh, it seemed like she was high. And once she approved me after a brief discussion, I was sent next door to a man with a, a binder with glossy uh, brochures uh, offering me different uh, uh, types of cannabis from different countries, from Israel to Denmark to various places. I, I got the impression that it was more of a, a marketing operation than a medical uh, operation, and that tainted my view. Uh, others will have had different experiences, but I think uh, it's worth remembering that these are early days and you need to be careful who you go to and who you listen to. Other things I tried, which I uh, still am trying from time to time is a back brace to, to try to straighten things up in case the, it would help with the pressure. I tried CBD oil and frankly, it didn't help with my pain, uh, especially uh, in 2021 when it, when it went crazy. And, and that pain lasted uh, close to a year. Uh, it, I, I woke up with pain in the middle of the night. I had pain all day long. Um, the, the CBD oil did help, however, with sleep, which was beneficial because the, the pain was waking me up. So at least CBD oil 
got me through the night and I, I could wake up feeling like I had slept. Um, the, I tried synthetic THC, Nabilone, which was prescribed by my nef nephrologist. And I found that, strangely enough, too powerful. I felt, I felt literally like I was uh, flying high uh, and it, it wasn't a very high dose. And I, I stopped using uh, a natural cannabis at that point because I thought maybe I'm getting too much and I, it still didn't work for me. So uh, I then ended up in a pain clinic and, and this is a, a doctor who does nothing but treat pain. And so um, he did MRIs and other things. And I came back to him and he said, your kidneys are pressing against your muscles and your, uh, and your spine, which I already, I already knew. Uh, and I, you know, the, what could he do for me? Nothing. Um, that, that's not the sort of pain he normally deals with. And so he said, you might try a physiotherapist. So I was literally back um, to the beginning after the, the pain clinic. And so we tried again through my nephrologist, a pregabalin, which definitely worked with the pain, but it, I, I found it far too powerful. Uh, again, I felt high all the time. Uh, and so we tried gabapentin, which I currently take, and, and that worked. And uh, what I've sort of settled on is a combination of gabapentin and uh, limited or, or, or at least careful cannabis use uh, as, a, as a combined strategy. And that seems to be working for me. It doesn't eradicate the pain, but it minimizes it and, and gives you some control over it. Uh, just just for those who are interested in CBD oil, that, that's what it looks like, comes in a little bottle, and you just screw off the top and put some, you know, like an eyedropper uh, on your tongue when you need it. The it, if, if you do try it and it does work for you, the advantage that I think uh, there is in that is if you feel those sharp stabbing pains and you need quick, immediate relief, and if CBD oil works for you, it's ideal. Just a few drops, and 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 you get some quick relief, and then you can, uh, you know, uh, move to wherever you need to move to, or or do whatever you need to do. Because as a patient, I'm 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 experimenting um, in trying to figure out what works for me. Um, the, I have had to to not go to a, you know, not take a prescription to a pharmacist but try different strains of cannabis freely available in Canada uh, at, uh, at legal outlets. Now, if, if you go this route and you haven't been exposed to this before, the first thing you're gonna notice is that there are countless strains with crazy names. Uh, I've just taken this uh, at random off of uh, what I find to be a useful website called leafly.ca, you can see it at the top, L-E-A-F-L-Y.ca, uh, which is a crowdsourced um, site. I'm not endorsing it. I get no money from them. I have no relationship with them, but I find it useful because there's a lot of users who will report their experience. So you, you can notice here, there's, gin, there's a strain called ginger ale, there's Maramota number 10, there's purple punchsicle, um, not the normal uh, names you encounter when you're dealing with medicine, but, but that's where we are. So, so which one do you want to try for pain? The useful thing I find about uh, Leafly, and I'll show you that slide in a second, is it takes you through what other speakers have already indicated, this complex um, uh, network of of strains, ty uh, of types of strains, of, for instance, the indica versus sativa discussion, uh, and you can find online all sorts of information about this. Again, my personal experience is I had to try it to find out what worked for me. The the indica strains, uh, the CBD levels have to uh, are, are usually higher. Uh, those don't work for me. The sativa 
strains are, are THC dominant, and I get a lot more pain relief. And I think uh, I'll defer to others, but I find that the THC is what is what helps my pain. Uh, and the flip side of that is the THC is what makes you high. So that's why you've got to be careful. Um, the I have not tried hybrid, hybrid strains recently, but the more I think about it, the more the better solution might be in those hybrids. Because you're combining THC with CBD, it, it, it just might work better. But I have no idea. Uh, maybe others uh, with us tonight will have experience they can share. Um, in the end, it, it, it wasn't medical professionals who guided me to the strain that I currently use. And, and that's, that's where I'm a bad patient. The, the people I found who understood strains and pain the most were the people selling it. Colloquially known, uh, at least around here, as Budmeisters. And again, be careful because uh, I went to a number of Budmeisters. Definitely some of them were high and definitely they were not experienced to give advice in treating pain. I did, however, find, and again, I'm not endorsing anything, it's just my experience. I found a very helpful people at the government run cannabis shops uh, in uh, British Columbia, it's called BC Cannabis Stores. And, and I found them to be um, far more professional in their approach to providing information uh, responsibly. And, and uh, I repeat this again, you're going to, I feel, have to experiment until you find the strain that works for you. Now, the, I want to just quickly show you Leafly because I think it's very helpful in, in guiding. Uh, I just picked again at random something called ginger ale just to, to show you what information is available here. So, so we're talking about dried flower buds. Um, the, I, I settled on dried flower because uh, against the advice that you just heard from the experts, I, I just find it easier to dose and easier to deal with. Um, acknowledging that that can have an effect on your lungs. So, so just uh, you know, be moderate about it would be my advice. Uh, and uh, I do agree with others that you don't wanna smoke it. Um, smoking, uh, putting smoke in your lungs is obviously not good for your health at all. Uh, I vape it, uh, which is not burning the product, it's heating it up so that you take vapor off of it. But again, you've already heard that there are risks to that, so weigh there, those risks. The, the most helpful number uh, I find on Leafly uh, to start with is this THC percentage. Um, I, I don't know how scientific this is, but I have found that it's a useful guide to potency. So 22% is high. If, if you have never used cannabis before and you start at 22%, uh, you might be shocked. Um, I have, as I said, I've used cannabis on and off for half a century. I find 22% high. And I would never um, uh, use it if, if I have to, for instance, uh, pick some, someone up at the subway uh, later that day or uh, do some work or, or do, do anything that requires a concentration and, um, a, 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 you know, anything that's, that's not physically risky. Um, and, and life is of, often not that predictable. So I would advise you to be careful because something might come up. You have kids who need to be picked up at school or whatever. And if you've just been smoking 22% THC cannabis, uh, that, that, that it wouldn't be a good idea to leave the house, in my opinion. So, so if you can uh, program your life to the extent that you have some predictable times when you can use this, that's better than, than, than just uh, getting caught in a bad situation. Other things that are very useful on the Leafly site, I find, are, are these strain effects. 
Each strain uh, usually has these things. So again, I picked ginger ale at random. I've never used it before. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the users say that it makes you feel tingly, giggly, euphoric, and the negatives are dry mouth. Um, but it also helps with pain, users say. 100% of people who've used it say it helps with pain. Uh, they also say it helps with stress and anxiety. Um, you've heard this again uh, before, but I'll stress it again because I have got myself in difficult situations because I wasn't aware of unintended consequences. Uh, here, here's another strain picked at random, the, the, the gelato strain. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm just going to bounce back here. The uh, so feelings of euphoria, uh, arousal, happiness, the negatives, dry mouth, paranoia. Um, th that is the biggest negative side effect I find myself dealing with. Uh, the and and I, I I don't know how to advise anyone on this, but if if you start uh, to find yourself in a rut of paranoia where where you just don't feel like yourself anymore. Um, you, you need to slow down and, and you need to talk to a trusted person, a medical professional and deal with it because you can get yourself in, in a lot of trouble with things like paranoia. Um, and now here, here's where I'm a really bad patient. I, I, I've settled on um, vaping largely because when I tried edibles, I found it very difficult to control the dose. And, and I got suddenly very high at times that it was uh, frankly frightening. Um, just my personal experience, vaping allows me to decide how far I wanna go uh, in different circumstances. The, I'm, I'm showing two here. The, the, I'm not endorsing these again. I received no money, uh, but these are popular uh, uh, brands. Um, they're reliable. I've had them for some years and they're not cheap, but, but since they are reliable in my experience, uh, the cost is spread out over a, a fairly long period of time. The one on the left is the one that I find most useful for immediate doses. You can, it's called a PAX-3 now. Uh, it'll fit in a purse or your pocket, so you can take it anywhere. And and the, the, you can see in the, the top there, the mouthpiece pops out. That's what turns it on. In about a minute or a minute and a half, it's heated up to a green stage and you can inhale. So if if you're going, going through the workday and you have no pain, and then suddenly something has happened that is just unbearable and you need a puff you can pull that out of your pocket or your purse in in a couple of minutes you've got relief and you've only taken a two or three puffs enough to to calm yourself to get that pain uh, down to a manageable level and you just turn it off and put it back in your pocket um the the, the balance that i have achieved i think means that i that i'm not going to use a lot of cannabis, um, you know, meaning over uh, over a period of uh, of more than some minutes, except on weekends. The and and again, I, I'm just one person. This might work for you. It might not. But given the other medications I'm taking, the other strategies I use, I find that the the intense relief I get on weekends, watching a movie or doing whatever. Uh, actually lasts. It, it takes me, uh, when I stop using it on a Sunday night, I can still feel relief on a Monday and a Tuesday, and it starts to wear off gradually. That that could just uh, be me, uh, but, but I think I'm right about that. And again, it's in combination um, with gabapentin. So I think those two combined are what's giving me that more prolonged relief. But by the end of the week, I, I need a more intense relief again. So on weekends, I allow myself that. Uh, read the fine print. I, I, I went over this a bit 
before. Um, the, you can see if you go closer on this label that it has the THC, um, per, uh, it's uh, milligrams per gram written in there, the total THC. You won't see on this label, at least on this product, the, the percentage that I mentioned before, which is far more useful in my experience than that 8.1 milligram. The, I can tell you, um, uh, because I, I looked on, uh, on various sites, that the product Liberty Haze uh, has a maximum THC per percentage around 22%. So it, it's an intense product. Um, the, you won't see that information on the label best to check through other sources. Um, some things that you've already heard before worth repeating, consult your doctor. And, and if your doctor doesn't wanna hear about it, at least let them know. Um, when I was admitted uh, with, uh, with chest pains to the hospital a couple of weeks ago, one of the first questions they asked uh, was, are, are you on non-prescription medicine? Um, and I was straight with them. I said, I use cannabis on the weekends, and they noted it. Um, the, if, if you do run into trouble and you don't uh, tell medical professionals this information, you could get into even more trouble. So be honest about it. Um, uh, we already went into, you know, be careful when you use it. Uh, be careful of those drug interactions. I frankly have not heard any scientific information on interactions between gabapentin and cannabis. If it's written down somewhere, I would love if someone would send it to me um, because I notice when I wake up in the morning that I'm groggy. People will say, you know, if you drink alcohol, you'll have a hangover, but if you use cannabis, you won't. I beg to differ. If you use cannabis at the level that I use it at, which is, is only sufficient to deal with the pain, you're going to feel groggy uh, when, when you wake up from it, in my opinion. Um, be very careful not to cross borders with it. The, uh, it's very easy to have your, your cannabis, you, the, you know, whether it's gummies or whatever material you're using, and the delivery device in a purse or in a bag, and you forget, and then you find yourself at customs and someone says, what's this? You're in big trouble if that happens. So the, the routine I use is if I do travel within Canada or with in the city or the province with it, I put it in a special pouch so, so that I can take that pouch out of my suitcase. And, and there will be no risk, I hope, of me ever forgetting that it's there. For instance, in your car, if you cross the border into the United States, that would be a serious problem. Make sure you don't accidentally take it across a border. Keep it away from kids or pets. The, the, there are countless stories now of children and pets getting very sick because uh, uh, cannabis wasn't stored properly. And just to repeat, pain is your body trying to tell you something. Don't ignore it. And just final thoughts. Um, I, I, I've come to understand that relieving chronic pain at the level that uh, PKD patients can experience it is, is a strategy. You're not going to find one thing that works. And in, in my case, it's a strategy of cannabis prescribed medicine, um, exercise, and meditation. Um, the, the, the meditation part of it, uh, I, I will just briefly talk about. I, I have uh, a regular practice of Vipassana or insight meditation, which adheres to the, the early Buddhist teachings. And, and the basis of it is that if you experience something like pain, or if you experience something like euphoria, something that we normally call bad or something good, uh, you need to get beyond that and simply analyze it for what it is, neither good nor bad, neither craving nor avoiding. You, you become an observer. 
and and this sounds kind of odd it did to me uh, before i established this practice i thought well if you're in pain an excruciating pain it's pretty hard to be objective about it well as it turns out that's not true because now when i experience pain I, I literally can look at it from above or from the outside. And you start to ask yourself questions where, like specifically, where is it? Is it the burning pain? Is it that sharp pain? Is it pulsing? Is it moving up and down my body? And oddly enough, the more you analyze it from an objective perspective, calmly, without judgment, the more it melts away. And uh, I would I would welcome any research on that because I, I don't understand why it works, but it has worked for me, and others will tell you the same thing. Um, cannabis is a drug. Don't become dependent on it. You're, you, the, the key is you're trying to live your life as best you can, not to silence pain. If, if you get that in the wrong order, uh, you may not have any pain, but you won't have much of a life either. And and that point I've made so many times, get to know your pain better. It, it's, it's part of a conversation with your body. It's an intimate conversation. No one else is going to understand it as much as you do. So, so take, take the, the most important message from that pain that I take. You're alive. And as they say, uh, the alternative is a lot worse. And, uh, and that's my final point. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. That was uh, very insightful from a patient standpoint. Uh, I'll welcome all of our speakers back. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen. Uh, everyone can unmute um, and we'll go through uh, some questions um, that we've been asked. Uh, to cap out the last 15 minutes or so of this evening's presentation. Uh, so we had one uh, question come in that I'll send to Dr. Vivalacqua uh, to kick things off. Uh, this is from an individual who's currently dialyzing and is listed for uh, a transplant. And she's written, I was under the impression that if I used cannabis, I could be removed from the transplant list. I'd like to ask if that's changed. I was taking CBD oil prescribed by a physician for arthritis pain, but stopped so I didn't risk my transplant. Um, I know you talked about um, British Columbia specifically. Um, someone here in Ontario, would you have insight uh, for this individual? Yeah, so I mean, I can speak to the BC context where I say this is this isn't a con concern at all. Um, I can't say exactly, you know, I don't know the, the teams in Ontario, but I, I would suspect that it shouldn't be a concern. If they're going to have any concerns, there's a couple that they might say from the transplant uh, perspective. So one is just for any substance someone's using, they want to make sure that's not an issue. Uh, so and that would be the difference that we've heard a few times between using a substance versus actually misuse or, or, or some other issues with it. Um, but specifically from a transplant perspective, if they might have take issue with anything, it's the smoking aspect more than anything else. Just like some programs and different programs are different even if we're talking about smoking tobacco, right? Some might say it's an absolute non-starter. You need to quit before we'll transplant you. Uh, and others might allow that. And if anything, that might be the one that they have bring questions about just in terms of what it means for your uh, blood vessel health and everything. But specifically, if you're to go out of your way, that person said that they were taught using, uh, you know, a CBD oil or something like that, especially under the direction of their team. Uh, I would encourage them to be honest about it. I'd be kind of surprised if they would say that that's a, uh, a barrier to transplant. Again, can't speak for others, but I, I think it really has changed over the last few years. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we have one here from Ian, uh, uh, complimenting the presentations from you all uh, and thanking you for sharing your expertise. Uh, and then he asks uh, if you have any thoughts around cannabis types, which may be more impactful. So sativa versus indica versus hybrid, uh, any particular strains that people have seen more relief with. Maybe I'll kick it off and then I'll uh, uh, see what Dan and Claudia have to say. But this is where actually I, I want to disagree with you, Paul, where you're saying you weren't a good patient. You're, I think this is actually, you're doing it in exactly the right way. 
um, you're very thoughtful about it and analyzing, uh, you know, what's working and what doesn't. And, you know, you'll see some various themes out there. If you go Googling, I've actually referred people to that Leafly website too, because it's actually one of the biggest databases in terms of what people have found effective for, for what. But I think the biggest thing you'll see is there's huge amounts of variability. And, you know, I'd see what Claudia and Dan say, but this is something we still don't understand incredibly well in terms of what the effects are. And by that, I mean, you heard that while the CBD technically or theoretically should have more of these symptom relief components than the THC, but in some people, it seems to be that there needs to be some THC for there to have effects. So it's not all or nothing. And there's these host of other chemicals that we don't really understand well, these, these terpenes that Paul alluded to that might be playing a role as well, meaning that it's it's actually quite variable. And I do encourage people to actually do exactly what you did, Paul, a kind of thoughtful trial and error, essentially, to say, you know, okay, this one, I liked the effects better than the side effects. This other strain gave me more side effects versus effects. So I kind of encourage that more than recommending any one specific strain because it's just so variable. I, I don't know, if, uh, Claudia and Dan, what, what, what you recommend to people. Yeah, so I, I agree. Um, so I would not recommend um, looking for a specific strain, maybe on a more general approach. Um, but what ha Paul had um, walked us through was a really good example to actually look at the THC percentage as well as the CBD percentage. Um, you know, this THC um, percentage has actually changed a lot over the years. Initially, I think maybe many, many years ago, the typical THC concentration would be around 3%, but nowadays it's 15%, probably minimum. Um, and so it's, it's very tricky depending on, you know, have you used it before? Um, are you completely, um, you know, is this completely new to you? Um, to to start off with something low percentage and it, there's no right amount for, we can't recommend you a, a perfectly right amount. Um, and you might have, it's a trial and error kind of thing. Um, but if you do start it and you never used it, start with something lower percentage of THC, 15% um, or perhaps even lower. Um, and uh, if you if you really want to try something maybe more clean, then use prescription the prescription cannabinoids or try um, the CBD oils. Yeah, I think um, uh, you know I echo that it's it's having a combination of THC and CBD that seems to be uh, the trick for a lot of people. There are pure CBD products out there, gummies, um, and the dose of actually CBD uh, orally can be um, surprisingly very high um, in order for people to get relief. But having that um, uh, mix and, uh, you know, <clears throat> Paul is absolutely right. There are now thousands of strains of um, of uh, the the hybrid species between the pure indica and the sativa, and uh, uh, you know sativa originally was uh, uh, it's sativa is Latin for cultivated. It was really originally cultivated for uh, hemp, for fiber, for rope, um, and so it's really come twisted over the centuries to uh, uh, have this um, psychoactive effect. Um, whereas indica originally came from the, uh, him, you know, sort of the, uh, um, the Kush mountain region of Pakistan and India, and that had a psychoactive effect. Um, so it's, it's really uh, come a long way over time. And uh, the THC uh, percentage is important to take uh, in account, but also, you know, look for that CBD. Uh, I know, Paul, one of the products you uh, showed on screen didn't really have any CBD content. So it just shows you the variability and response. Um, but um, uh, I echo Paul's comment about using that website. It's almost like a, a crowdsourcing input that you have a lot of people putting input about their personal experience with each of these products, but going to a licensed retailer where, uh, yes, they may not have um, medical uh, experience, but they have experience with these products um, probably offer better advice than uh, medical people. So uh, it is a journey, but uh, I think the, the take home here is to uh, get to know these uh, products, what works, what works for you. And uh, I'll leave it maybe to Paul to comment on any specific product, but uh, 
your experience may be different than his. Yeah, the, um, I, I agree with all that's been said. I, I would just repeat, and again, since you guys are on the cutting edge of the research, the, the problem I have with deciding what to do is I don't know what specifically is causing the pain. I have really big kidneys, I know that. But I, I've, I've come to believe that different pains are caused by different things. So for instance, the dull, more chronic pain, um, I, I think is just a size issue. But the sharp, the sharp, severe pain that can can really bring tears to your eyes can be like a momentary pressing on a nerve or something. So if it's nerve pain versus muscle pain, what's the best strategy for those two two different types of pain? That that that's the I think the answer to the question, lies somewhere in understanding the specifics of the pain. Yeah, I think you're right, Paul. And I think that that's actually one of the things I encourage people to do if they are keeping a symptom or pain diary is it's not just pain. Try to be pretty as specific as you can about what types of pain, and then you can try to figure out, okay, what is and what isn't responding. Because you're exactly right. Some of the types might respond well, and some of them might not. And so trying to be detailed when you're keeping records of that, I think, is a very helpful strategy. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the research has demonstrated that nerve type pain um, responds better to the cannabinoids rather than musculoskeletal pain. Um, and one thing that we haven't commented on, and it's sort of emerging in some of the research that by using um, uh, cannabinoids, uh, you're really just affecting yet another receptor in our body, right? So we have opiate receptors, we have cannabinoid receptors, um, we have the uh, GABA receptors that the uh, things like gabapentin will affect. So we're just utilizing a different receptor in the pathway of pain. So by, by reaching out for a cannabinoid, uh, what we're doing is perhaps reducing uh, the need or the dose for the other pain relievers. So we know the, the potential problems of opiates. We know the potential problems of gabapentin. But if we can reduce the dose, and you know, experience is, is demonstrating that maybe antidepressant doses may be less because of cannabis use. So there's, um, there's the direct effect of reducing pain or other symptoms, but there's a sidebar sort of effect of maybe limiting doses of other medications. So, um, you know, I think knowing the pain, as Paul says, is important. Is it musculoskeletal? Maybe that's better treated by something else. But, um, you know, so listening to and recording just how things work for you is uh, another good take-home message. So Mike was kind uh, to plug the uh, pain document and diary uh, that BC Renal and the PKD Foundation of Canada uh, drafted up uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, so what we'll do is we'll circulate it to all of the participants uh, this evening um, to encourage uh, that they take a look at it um, and, of course, uh, start to compile um, a pain management diary. Um, just about the logging uh, component, Paul, I'm wondering with respect to going back a bit about all of the, the strains and the types and the, uh, the strength of certain uh, cannabis products, have you ever kept a, a diary with respect to what you're using and how that's benefited you so that you are able to, to keep track of the different types and, and to see if there is a pattern to what works well for you? Sadly not, it, it, was, it was really just hit or miss. Um, and again, using using a site like Leafly and talking uh, to the, the people at the counter um, and, and also talking to medical professionals, that, that's where I ended up where I am. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the strain I'm using. It's um, the, I think it's affecting my personality. So I'm still searching for something that relieves the pain that that doesn't change who I am that that's the hard part 
And so I, I, I trust, are you, are you logging the uh, effects that you're finding from a, a personality standpoint, or is that just, again, you, you just noticing a difference? Um, I, I, I'm logging them in my head. I'm not keeping a physical diary, right. but, but I am telling myself, um, you know, the, the, I, I mentioned paranoia earlier because I'm feeling elements of paranoia from time to time. Okay. The, uh, you know, the, I've already mentioned that I use it mostly on weekends. And, and when I do use it, um, I start to, uh, to doubt, uh, you know, certain things that I know to be true, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and when I'm not using it, I can look back at the experience and say, be careful because something's not right there. And so uh, the stage I'm at now is to find a strain that gives me that relief, but doesn't have the, the psychological side effects. But I'm, I, I haven't reached that point yet. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, just uh, a last call for any questions for those that are still with us. Um, by all means, you can uh, drop your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and just while we see if there's any last minute ones, uh, Mike, a, a question for you. Um, with respect to patients that don't have um, any history of using um, marijuana products over the years, um, and have reservations. I know we talked about certain things and what to watch for, and of course, to start slow and, and uh, you know, the metrics of the products. But is there, is there anything that you hear consistently from patients with respect to reservations about trying something that, that did have uh, a certain stigma tied to it for so many years? Yeah, honestly, I think that's the the biggest part is that last thing that you just said is people are really worried about, you know, oh, I've had extra patients come to me and, and they admitted they were worried to bring it to me that I might judge them or, or, you know, think differently about them. And this is where I really go back to saying, you know, as a physician, seeing somebody who's got a large symptom burden and nothing's really worked, I'm more than happy to encourage them to and to try to work with them to find something that 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 might work for them, right? And so, yeah, you know, there might be some pros and cons, there might be some bumps along the way, but I think just uh, just taking that step to be honest about it and to, you know, recognize that no, at this point, uh, I'd be surprised if people have a lot of significant judgment, especially if you're wanting to try it for a very real and significant symptom. Uh, and not to be too judgmental about some of my colleagues, but if, if someone is is judging you for that, I think it's their issue, not yours, right? I, I think at this point, we're all working to try to, to get you some relief. So yeah, to me, that's actually been the biggest thing. I have people, you know, from all walks of life that you would not expect, uh, you know, elderly patients or little mild mannered uh, people who you would never would think of, and they're almost embarrassed to bring it forward, right? Uh, but you could tell it's something that they've really been thinking about and wanting to try. So yeah, I, I think that's actually in a lot of people, the biggest hurdle to get over is that, yeah, there's, there's no judgment here. This is not something that has the stigma it used to have. And that's why, you know, it was such a, a perfect pairing with all of you this evening, because to also hear from Paul, uh, from a patient standpoint, right, who's the one living with the pain uh, day in and day out and can testify to, you know, having tried a variety of other avenues. And that's that's the commonality with, with PKD patients, right? They've tried everything um, yeah. for so long that they're most often desperate for any relief, um, you know, even if, if very short term. Um, one last question, but I think I'm going to know all of you will plead the fifth on this. Uh, we've been asked if uh, any of you have recommended licensed producers. So, so um, okay. oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. If we're if we're talking about, uh, so again, we're not talking prescription race things or anything like that. I mean, to me, I really, really just emphasize to people that they have to go to a regulated place, you know, as far as uh, whether it's exactly the, in BC, we have, uh, you heard Paul mentioned the government run stores versus others that are private, but licensed, I actually have zero preference so long as it is you know, a licensed place. And it can be really deceiving. There are a lot of places that have, might have a nice, you know, shiny, modern looking store front, right? And it looks for all the world like a uh, place, but it's not. So I think if, to me, it's just check that this is actually a licensed and regulated place. Uh, um, so totally agree. Um, I don't think we have to say I, I haven't used enough of this or I actually don't use it. So I, I can't tell you if there's a preferred 
Alexis producer, but what I can tell you is on the Health Canada website, there is a list of all the licensed producers. So if you're not sure if the store that's near your home is a licensed producer, you can actually just type in its name or the address and it will confirm if it is or not. Incredible. Um, that's a great, great I, added insight. I'll, I'll just I, I only go to licensed producers, um, but uh, my basic rule is if the person I'm talking to seems to be high, uh, I'm not going to take advice from them. So so be fair careful. <laughs> that's a fair rule, Paul. I think that's that's fair. OK, well, in the interest of time uh, and that uh, we have no further questions to uh, to pose to the group, I would like to thank uh, Dan, Claudia, Paul and Mike uh, so much for your wonderful presentations. Uh, very insightful. Um, I know that uh, this will be a well received presentation um, for uh, many days to come. Uh, for those that uh, have joined us, we will have this recording available uh, on our website and on our YouTube um, in the coming days. So we'll make sure to circulate that and to stay tuned. Um, and then just to close out, of course, we will be having uh, additional educational events throughout the year and our virtual summit later in the fall. So if you aren't already signed up for our newsletters or BC Renal's newsletters, um, I strongly encourage you to do so. There's, there's always great information uh, coming out on a monthly basis. So again, from everyone in attendance uh, to our presenters, thank you all again so much uh, for your time and expertise tonight. Um, and I'll wish everyone a good evening. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Jeff.